I was the only person on board who had not been off the ship in 18 weeks. The air in the bay was dripping with humidity. I put on my most fitted corset for disembarking, aware that I would be noticed and commented upon. I piled up my hair and wore a hat. The atmosphere was so full of water that I noticed every hot, heavy movement, my legs damp with sweat. Still, as the lush green bay grew closer, my heart pounded. I looked up at the peak, making out one or two houses being built. Bamboo scaffolding, Robert said delightedly. He had brought up his binoculars. An excellent idea. Ingenious. My notice, however, had fallen to the dock, which was coming steadily closer. It teemed with tiny figures, despite the fact there were only five other ships in the bay. I took a deep breath or two, as if I were in the wings, and decided that I would try my best. The island looked lush and green, and not at all the unpleasant, arid rock I had expected. Perhaps my time in Hong Kong would pass well, if only I could make myself amenable. By now, I could make out individual faces in the mass of people going about their business. Wide-faced women were selling noodles and hot tea. Coolies with wooden chests strapped to their backs were scurrying from the docked vessels to the town. And rows of Englishmen in red uniforms were overseeing the business wearing pith helmets to protect their flushed faces from the sun. And back from the main bustle, Chinese women, dressed in brightly coloured satin dresses, lazily eyed the soldiers. As we watched our trunks unloaded and waited at the ward's cases were unbolted and brought down, Robert breathed deeply with satisfaction. I crept off to one side, finding my land legs hard to come by. The ground seemed to sway, and I felt quite in a haze. As if I'd taken a swig of laudanum at the back room of the theatre, as was pleasant to do from time to time. Along the dock, there was a wooden shrine with a cloud of incense smoke around it. I decided to try out the solid ground and make for that. There were two old women there, on their knees before it, praying, one whirling a wooden clapper, the other beating a brass gong. The latter approached me and offered a handful of incense sticks, gesturing for payment. I scrabbled inside my purse for a small coin, which she inspected, shrugged her shoulders, and carefully stowed away. I suppose it is normal to use English co coins around the world. We did own the island, after all. As I came closer, I saw there was a figure, roughly hewn from wood, and small pots with tropical flowers beneath gold and red Chinese script. There was so much incense already stuck into piles of sand, I was surprised the whole thing had not ignited. But I decided that I would light my own anyway, as a gesture, foolish perhaps, for my arrival. As the sticks began to smoke, I made a wish, concentrating hard on it. Please let us be all right. I prayed as the incense wound like a spell around me. Henry and I, Jane and the children, let us all do well. It was only as I walked away from the little shrine, I realized I had not included Robert in my thoughts. I just spent months on end with him, and now, two minutes apart, and he was the last thing on my mind. A place of adventure, Mary, Robert stiffly commented on my return. Surveying the dock with obvious delight, and full of adventurous men. His plans for me had evidently not changed in any respect other than location. However, I liked this little city. I bought a cup of green tea and sipped it. I'd become accustomed to the island quickly, enjoying the feel of solid ground. And, as the captain strode back up the gangplank to give his directions, I was only vaguely uneasy about the fact that an adventurous man not, may not be truly what I was looking for. 